but his strikeout rate is also ticking up. Th- th- there's some good hope for him. There's some power metrics to indicate that, that he might have a bump, but then there's met- metrics to indicate that he's going to get on base much less. Uh, it, it's a mixed bag with him. I think he gets the first shot in Toronto, but I think it's a quick hook for Kirk. So if I'm in a draft and hold situation, if I'm in a be- uh, I'm drafting Kirk as a backup to Jansen. I think that's the way to do it for for sure. Um, in a redraft league, mixed league, regular standard league, it's hard to pick Kirk if he's not doesn't have a starting position. He's somebody I think that you have to monitor really closely for the situation um, and. If you believe in him, I guess Jansen's okay to pick up in the meantime, as long as you think you can somehow get him on the waiver wire a week or so before he comes up. Any thoughts on that, Ryan? Yeah, I, I'm actually I'm a little bit more optimistic on Jansen um, than it sounds like you are. I, I, yeah, the batting average, like yeah, career 208 hitter in 550 at bats, like that's really not good for Danny Jansen. Um, but he doesn't strike out a ton, and he hits line drive, so he's got a career. 21% line drive rate and I mean that and an above average strikeout rate. So I, I think the ingredients are there for, for a better batting average. The kind of the age old question is, is his career, whatever, 230 ish BABIP is, is that his baseline over 550 at bats or is that still a small enough sample size where, um, we could expect that to kind of tick up a little bit. So I, I, I of these two, I definitely, I, and definitely from a playing time standpoint, Jansen, I, I think is going to start great lineup to hit in, even though he will be hitting towards the bottom of Toronto's lineup. But I'm actually fairly along with like Severino, we were just talking about, I'd probably take Jansen ahead of Severino um, at, at that top 380 P. I just think there's a little bit more batting average upside looking at kind of the deeper metrics that he's shown so far in his career. Again, nothing to get like, super excited about but i I do think there's a a decent chance that jansen's playable and that's about where he's going in the draft that's about as as good of praise as you can give some of these guys so yep fair enough uh ruben well danny jansen i'm a little bit nervous and a little bit optimistic just like both you guys it's a little of both his bad was 190 i mean that's that's very hard to do his home run to fly bar went up his barrels went up but his hard hit rate went down which you know it that doesn't make any sense. It's, it's either one of the it, it's something wrong there. And with Alejandro Kirk there, and the Blue Jays expected to be at least the second best team playing in Florida this year, then you know what? Kirk is going to get the batting is going to get more time because they want to win now. They have a team that they think that can make the playoffs, and you know what? They're going to push it. And and Kirk, but Kirk, I'm nervous about Kirk. He this is the first time last year he played above high A ball, and he only had like 25 plate appearances. So it's really, really, really hard to know what you're going to get with him. Um, he's going around. The the 21st round, which is actually before Severino, I'd rather have Severino, which is a more of a given thing. Even Tucker Barnhart, I, I think I'd ra- I, I know what I'm getting with him. With Alejandro Kirk, who's to say you're not getting the same thing like, Dan- like Danny Jansen? Now, the Blue Jays seem to be pretty good with picking catchers. They had Darno before. And they have a lot of history of, of of nurturing and bringing up these catchers. So you want to believe in that? Then you believe in Alejandro Kirk. But I just don't believe in it. All right, let's switch gears now to the utility-only players. I've identified three of them that you might be interested in, uh, according to ATC projections. First one is Fran Mil Reyes. Ryan, what do you think of this 25-year-old kid from Cleveland? The Franimal. Uh, I, I, I like I like the profile. It's a pretty bland one, though. So, like, he's going in the probably 10th round, just outside the top 150, it looks like. The question with Framel Reyes is, is that BABIP, is that batting average going to hold? Uh, Framel Reyes hit 275 last year with a pretty atrocious strikeout rate. Um, obviously has pretty pretty light tower power, uh, but no steal game uh, at all. Zero career steals in over 550 at-bats. So on the plus side, it is an age 25 hitter who has hit 37 home runs as recently as 2019 um, and hit 275 last year like that you know if that all sticks and he's on a Cleveland team where he is going to play every day in a lineup where I mean we like to bag on Cleveland for you know trading Francisco Lindor and that sort of thing but that lineup's really not that bad uh, still have uh, Jose Ramirez in there Eddie Rosario that sort of thing so the lineup's not bad um, it's just the the it's a team construction thing um, Framo Reyes and I was kind of hinting at this earlier with Grandall 
those low batting average, high power guys are almost a dime a dozen. Now, I, I don't want to, I don't want to sell Fran Mill short with that because there aren't too many guys that have been able to approach 40 home runs going outside the top 150 with a passable batting average. But um, just know that that profile is um, is pretty vanilla, and you can you can get similar type of skills guys later in the draft. So. Um, that's kind of where I stand on and we'll we'll see where that batting average goes. Uh, we're projecting at HQ 257 um, and 34 bombs from Framo Reyes over 550 at bats. So we'll we'll see what happens. I totally disagree with uh I think that he's he's uh he's a winner. Um I don't have that that many different statistics than for ATC than you mentioned and at that at that price he he's going in just at the end of the 10th round. I, we're talking a couple rounds bargain here. We're talking about a guy who can hit 40 home runs. He had 37 just just two years ago. Um, his lifetime barrel lifetime barrel rate of 13 percent, and it's been consistent every year. I mean, there's no steals. ATC is projecting point two steals. So uh, one every one every five years. We'll five years. <laughs> yeah, five year return on that. Um, he's got a very good walk rate. The problem is his strikeout rate. But aside from that, we're talking mega run production in a, a better-than-you-think lineup, as you mentioned. He could hit 90 RBIs, 80 runs, 40 homers. This reminds me of Adam Dunn, but a much better batting average than Adam Dunn. I think that, I mean, he's shown he's a lifetime average of 263. Now, that might be high, but high 250s, I think, is more than doable. That's what I'm projecting. Um, I think this is an extraordinary player that could be a fourth round player that you're getting in the tenth round. Um, I, I, I'm I'm high on this guy. I, I I don't see any downside risk. Like, what's the risk? He hits two forty. Uh, you know, he's not he's not going to turn into Joey Gallo here. Um, I, I I'm I'm high on this guy, Ruben. I think his downside is that he hits between 25 and 35 home runs. I mean, that's that's the downside for him. Um, he the problem last year is that he hit a, he lowered his home run to fly ball rate. His hard hit rate was down, so he those things can bounce back. Now, one guy he actually I'm thinking about. I was looking at his stats. I'm thinking who else in the Cleveland Indians at that age was a little bit similar to this. Now, ATC protection projection for Fran Reyes for his age 26 year is 35 homers, 91 RBIs, 260 average. Carlos Santana, age 26, produced 20 homers, which, you know, he increased that, 74 RBIs, and a 268 average. Cleveland knows what they're doing when they're getting these home run hitters. I have all the confidence in the world that Cleveland knew what they were doing when they traded for him, and I think he's going to have a bounce back year. Just the last thing that that that, that I, I didn't mention was, was the ground ball rate, too, with Fran Reyes. Like, a 50% ground ball rate last year. Let's see if he can. I mean, if he makes that launch angle adjustment, I always say this, and, and, and Eno Saris has said this, too, at, at First Pitch Arizona. I'd much rather have a guy who has the hard hit capability of like a Fran Reyes who can then adjust. It's easier to adjust, uh, make a launch angle change than just... Uh, you know, deciding to hit the ball harder. That's a skill that you either have or you don't. So uh, let's see where that ground ball rate goes with Fremel Reyes. I think a lot's yeah. going to kind of hinge on that for, for this season. Yeah, I, I just don't see the downside. I, I, there's more upside than downside here. Uh, and at the pick, like, uh, it, 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 well, if I told you that he's going to only hit 30 home runs, you know, with everything else, is, is he's still a bargain, right? You can do a sensitivity test. What if he hits only 28 home runs? Probably worth than the value, right? I I I don't see him dropping to twenty too. Uh, I I don't see much downside here, and uh, especially run production. If he bats in the middle of that lineup and stays healthy, it's going to come. Uh, two more guys, Jorge Jorge Soler. Um, I've noticed a lot of uh, similarities between Soler and Chris with the K Davis. Um, his power indicators are as high as ever. Statcast is showing he's hitting the ball hard as ever. He walks a lot, and it's been steady. Strikeout rate has been going up, so I don't think he will hit anywhere near 260s as he has been. Um, I think we're talking a 240s player. Um, so, I, I, you know, I think this is a guy who can fit the profile. And, um, you know, similar to what you said, Ryan, I think that this is a, a very similar profile that you see. The, the 85 RBI, 25, 30 homer guy with the 250 average. That's Jorge Soler. He's not unique, and you know, in the utility slot is uh, a net bust. I, I, Fran Reyes again. I have a tick 
higher than that because I think the average is a playable average. But at this level, Solaire has just so many other people that have the same quality, the same profile. It's not unique and not that interesting. Certainly if he drops, and I think Solaire in an auction to me is more likely to come to me than in a draft – because maybe his auction price falls to seven dollars, and I say, "Oh, okay, he's a thirteen dollar player, seven, eight bucks. That makes sense for the value." I don't see me grabbing him in a draft. You have thoughts on Siller? You, yeah, you covered him great. The one thing I'll add, um, and I agree, like a lot of that profile is the same. Um, the one thing I'll add is he had that oblique strain that put him on the IL in September last year. And whenever I see that, and then I'm kind of wading into Ruben's territory here with injury analysis, <laughs> I just I, I wonder was that bothering him throughout the year, and was that, and then he finally in September, Kansas City's out of it said okay i'm gonna i'm gonna shut it down i'm gonna go on the il played hurt and that sort of thing um you could take that and say okay so maybe we throw out 2020 that's a mulligan he was playing hurt and he had the oblique injury and and i expect to bounce back the the downside to that is Soler also had oblique problems in 2015 and 2017 so this is kind of a recurring theme um for somebody who's not young anymore uh 20, age 29 season so um I do wonder if the down year was, you know, how much the oblique strain played into that. And if, if you think it did and you read those tea leaves and then it did there that, you know, there's definite bounce back potential because uh, yeah, like a year ago he was coming off a 48 home run, 117 RBI season. Like no one's expecting that again. But uh, if you're playing that, you know, playing hurt injury rebound card, um, that's kind of the, the case to be made for Solaire. So yeah, Ruben, I'd be interested to get your take on that with the kind of the history of oblique injuries, but how much that might've impacted him uh, last year. Well, oblique injuries tend to keep someone out anywhere between six to eight weeks on average the last couple of years. And the season last year was eight weeks. So a lot of times players will hide the injury or change their swing a little bit just so they can yep. continue to play. And I think that's what he did because he was still on pace to hit 28 home runs even with the oblique injury. My question is, and I think he's going to be completely healthy. I don't think it's going to be an issue. And I think he'll have the same power he always had. However, he, his Babbitt last year was 317 and he batted 228 with a 317 Babbitt. That where that scares me that's that's getting into adam dunn territory that that's if if he get if his babbitt goes back to his career down a couple like like 20 30 points his batting average is going to be even lower if he's healthy and he's able to swing normally and he's got his regular swing back then that's fine but otherwise i'm very nervous with him yeah 48 homers back in 2019 that's not that far ago and you're right if the oblique if he was concealing um maybe a 30 homer projection is light for him and by golly, that would be, as I said, Chris Davis. He would hit 240, 247 and, and hit about 37, 38 homers. So uh, I think he fits that profile, which is fantastic. Um, but there, there are some others available, and I, I prefer Fran Mill so much more. Um, let's go to the last uh, player, Shohei Otani. Um, you know, the question is health. He's going to be pitching. If, I, if I'm the Angels, I probably would just say the hell with the pitching. You know, just just hit. You're probably more valuable in a fantasy standpoint. He's more valuable as a uh, as a hitter. If you are in a league with weekly transactions, you are not drafting Shohei Otani as a pitcher at all. You are drafting him as a hitter only. If you are in a league with uh, daily lineup switches, then it becomes more interesting because you can use Otani for both, and the value that you get is almost. Add it, almost adding up the two, but even better because it's only one roster spot. Like you're getting all the pitching and the, all the hitting uh, uh, from both from him, and you only have to take up one roster slot. So he's the the single biggest difference in uh, daily lineup guys versus weekly. Um, you know, it's a twenty. He's a twenty fifteen guy in my opinion. That's what he's been on the pace for his career. Um, he's still young. He's only twenty six. It's a question of health, but uh, he is going in the 17th round. And as a hitter, 2015, 15 stolen bases in the 17th round with a decent power stroke and batting average. I mean, uh, he's hit in the 280s the first two years of his career. Um, uh, this is a value that's enormous to me. 
Um, Ruvain, what what's his issues with health? Is uh, oh, oh, of course, I should mention though um, that uh, being that he pitches, he's not going to bat the day after, the day of, and the day before he's going to pitch. So the at bats could be hindered by that. Plus, the Angels have a DH problem. Who who's going to DH? Pujols. You got Jared Walsh. Like I I, I, I can see him losing some at bats, but on a per at bat basis, this guy is phenomenal. Uh, Ruvain, can you talk to his injury and everything else? Well, he is healthy. He's pitching. Um, the one thing that they're concerned about right now is that his velocity is down two two miles per hour already. 